Woo, indeed. Hello, world. What is up? Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Matt Forte. We are here live at the Build studio in New York City. Our next guests are Peabody Award-winning director and an NBA Hall of Famer. So that's pretty freaking cool. Actually, that Hall of Famer was also the last dude to bring home a championship here in New York. So show some respect, all right? This is amazing. Make some noise. Now... Their latest collaboration is the wildly ambitious 20-hour ESPN documentary series Basketball, A Love Story, a collection of 62 short stories on the NBA, ABA, college hoops, the women's game, international basketball, and sociocultural issues told by, if you can believe it, 165 legends. And one of those legends is in the building. That's right, in just a few short moments, here to tell us all about how they pulled it off. I got director Dan Cloris here and producer and all-time great Earl the Pearl Monroe. Make some noise, everybody. Come Mom, Let's do it up. I can't wait to dive in and talk about the film uh, series, but before we do, we got a quick look at it, so let's go ahead and run that clip. Can you tell me your name, please? My name is LeBron James. You know me? Lisa Leslie. Patrick Ewing. Bill Bradley. Earl Monroe. Shaquille O'Neal. Kobe Bryant. Magic Johnson. <laughs> Pat Riley. But really, my name is Coach. They call me the Ice Man. Jim Beheim. Jim Calhoun. Gino Ariema. Rebecca Lobo. Cheryl Miller. Dick Vitale. John Calipari. Mike Krzyzewski. Christian Leighton. Adam Silver. My name is David Stern. My name is Alan Madison. Charles Barkley. Julius Irvin. Dirk Nowitzki. My name is Steve Kerr. Kevin Durant. My name is Stephen Curry. Who are you rushing? Five kids. Phil Jackson. Oscar Robertson. Jerry West. Nancy Lieberman. Tony Parker. Bill Walter. Anthony Davis. Chris Paul. I keep my life. I didn't choose it. It chose me. Oh, man. Ladies and gentlemen, one more time. Make some noise for Dan Clores and Earl the Pearl Monroe. Uh, gentlemen, first of all, thank you so much for being here and hanging out with us. Thank you. Uh, it's so nice to have you on the show. And uh, it's pretty cool here. I mean, I never oh, been here. It's man. nice, right? <laughs> I'm glad you dig it, man. It's great, awesome. man. Uh, congratulations! This is incredible. Uh, what an amazing series. I, I I watched as much as I could fit in. You know, t t 20 hours. Is, there's so much great stuff out there uh, for for us to to kind of take in and watch. Uh, I want to get into the whole process. I want to get into the, the idea, the whole nine. But how are you guys doing? Let's just start there, real simple. How's life right now? Oh, life is great. Life is good, yeah. You know, after seeing this. And, you know, last evening, uh, it was on uh, ESPN. And right. we've been getting a lot of uh, calls, you know, from last evening. So it's been great. That's amazing. Yeah, you know, that's right. It's been available in the ESPN app, uh, I think, since September. But last night it started. It was airing on ESPN, you know, in uh, in its entirety. There, we're getting all the pieces back to back. Uh, Dan, how does it feel for you to be on the other side of this huge project? It's out into the wild. People are seeing it. They're responding to it. How are you feeling right now? I feel good. You know, we, we made a <laughs> we made a twenty hour, ten part film in four and a half years. It you, oh you, you, usually takes me not usually takes me two years to make a ninety minute film. So I'm anxious to go on vacation. But <laughs> but um, but we we set out doing what we wanted to do. I I, I know we made a great movie. Yeah. So now, now the chips will fall where they are. <laughs> when does, because uh, you, now you're doing press, you're hanging out uh, on shows like ours here and talking about it. When does the work officially end for you? When do you get to take that vacation? Monday, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so we're close. You're that's in the home it, stretch. Yeah, yeah, that's it. You know, like, I mean, it, it goes on every Tuesday night for four that's hours right. except election day. So, so uh, but last night was fun because I'm, Completely ignorant of anything that has to do with new media. Yeah. So, but I got three kids that I, you know, 15, 17, and 20. So, I watched it last night. And uh, but what I was wa I was watching it, and at the same time following Twitter. You know, yeah. so that was fun for me. <laughs> and that's pretty cool, man. You know, like I guess when they like, it's it's cool when they like something. You yeah. know, it's not cool when they don't. So, like uh, the stuff on Twitter was great. There, there were. You know, a couple of a uh, couple little knocks, but it, what, I would say 98 percent was yeah. terrific. Man. Which, for any type of review, but especially on Twitter, has a hell of a ratio. Yeah, you can get 98 percent positive. <laughs> yeah, of what you're looking at you're doing all right. You're doing something right. Yeah, it was cool. Man. That's that's pretty cool, man. Yeah, so that's right. It's every Tuesday right now, seven to eleven, and then it notches up on the 30th. It goes eight to midnight, I believe. Uh, right. No, yeah. well, yeah, that's what that <laughs> that's what it is. But it's not every Tuesday. You can catch them there, Aaron. There, uh, so exciting. Oh, let's go. Let's go 
back a little bit, man. Let's let's start about the impetus. I know you had the idea forever ago. It was supposed to be a ten-hour series. I think when you first conceived of it, is that right? Yeah, it, ma- many years ago, uh, uh, I I pitched it to uh, Dick Ebersol at NBC, and he he is a great television executive, and he, he, Adam Silver introduced me to him before he was commissioner. I went to meet him in his offices at Thirty Rock, and. He's very sophisticated, savvy guy, and uh, I didn't even know he turned me down. We're walking out of the office. <laughs> he's taller than er- yeah. Earl. He puts his hand around my shoulder, and I thought, yeah. "Oh, this is a great meeting," and it was a no. You know? <laughs> Earl, then, were you? Uh, was Earl a part of the process at no, that time? Then I, no, but 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 you know how life works. Because he uh, turned me down, and then ESPN said yes, but then about a month later they said, "Oh, we don't have the money." That's when I met Earl, huh. because I, they said, we want to do something with you, ESPN. So I came up with this idea that turned out to this movie, Black Magic, about uh, uh, basketball players and coaches from historical black colleges only, something I didn't know much about. And I met Earl a little bit before that, but of course, Earl went to Winston-Salem State, and and I called Earl. I said, this is what I'm doing. Would you be interested in, in doing this together? Would you be interested in, in producing this? And, and he was gung-ho, and, you know, we got lucky and, and won the Peabody. And, but they ran that without any commercial interruptions. You know, like last night, that was driving me a little nuts, all the commercials. You know? <laughs> but so that, that was the – so, you know, that's how life works sometimes if you're lucky. Earl, what, what was what were you thinking back then when you got that call to be a producer on this project and, and get involved? Was that your first time uh, doing that, working in that capacity as a producer? In this particular media, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I've been in the music business for about for you, 35, yeah. 40 years. So, you know, it's um, kind of a, just the next step up. Um, certainly I've been involved, you know, interested in things like this and certainly when you talk about historically black institutions you know that uh, was kind of right up my alley and uh, I thought it was great to be able to let people know you know what had gone on back then and the interesting thing about it since we've done that um, you know people are still asking Where's the next Black Magic coming out? Well, I said, hey, we, we, we just did something called Basketball Love Story. So, uh, you know, hopefully somewhere along the line, you know, those things are kind of running to each other. I got one question. Why is the dude wearing a Red Sox shirt look so unhappy, man? <laughs> what the hell is your story, man? Is that like a phony T-shirt? You're not really a fan or what? It's be- we've, been, we've been giving him hell since he walked in the door. That's why. <laughs> I mean, give me a break, dude. <laughs> Told you not to wear that shirt. Uh, so, let me ask you this: What was so when when you heard the idea, man, for for the, this series? When when Dan said to you, you know, I want to do something big and grand. I want to do something, you know, huge in scope. What, what, what was your thought then? Were you excited to jump in, man? Well, obviously, I mean, anything that you know Dan does is pretty much you know it's going to be correct. And so, obviously, I wanted to be involved with it. Um, Dan has, uh, you know, opened up a lot of doors for a lot of people. And, you know, to shine light on, you know, the game, not just the game that we need, that we see on TV every day, but the game, you know. And now we have a, a, a good insight as to what the game was about, how it came about. You know, there are certain segments segments in this that, um, you know, move me. Uh, I, I would tell Dan now, but there's one segment in this here where we talk about the 76ers. And, you know, I had suggested that we use this this um, uh, song called um, uh, 454, which by <laughs> Pieces of a Dream. That didn't get used in this here, but I always thought as though that was something that was very indicative of the 76ers and they're winning a championship. That being said, I mean, this, this, you couldn't do, you couldn't cover basketball any better than this has been covered. And, uh, you know, you had to put a, uh, you know, give the kudos to uh, Dan, um, you know, the, the researchers, uh, and especially the editors. And, and when you think about trying to edit, you know, 20, 20 hours after this, of this. Yeah, you know, Dan, I know uh, early on you had said that it wasn't going to be chronological. You wanted to do something uh, a little uh, non-linear sort of and, 
and not a, a history, like a retelling. You didn't want to do that, uh, and, and you wanted to capture more of the essence of the game, the essence of the obsession and the love of the game. Where, what were some of the other uh, keystones for you going into this that you wanted to make sure you hit and things, different aspects of the project that were really important to you? Well, that, that was part of the process. Um, that was a big thing. I didn't want to do a linear, mini-biographical story you know, okay, here's five minutes on Michael Jordan and four on Will Chamberlain, and here's in seven minutes on women in basketball. I mean, I, I feel like that's kind of been done in different long form films. I wanted to do something different, but I, but the idea of a love story hit me pretty quickly because I feel like basketball, unlike other sports, there's a real emotional connection to it you can get whether you're an Earl Monroe or whether you're a high school player or a guy calling talk radio all the time or a guy wearing a Red Sox shirt in New York you know like <laughs> like you 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 can get you get into it and because the little boy and now the little girl the last 20 years can be out there by him or herself Escaping the house, learning, practicing, growing, forming friendships, pretending to be someone else. And that's an emotional connection. So to me, obsession is a form of love. So each, not a healthy form, but each one of these 62 stories is about both sides of love. It has, you know, the joy and the wonder, the embrace and the disappointment and the loss and there's 19 women. They're integrated throughout the entire piece. There's 18 people born outside of America, China, Nigeria. You know, they're integrated throughout the whole piece. It's not like, oh, here's an international scene or here's like a women's scene. So I, we did what we wanted to do. Yeah. And uh, it's different. It's completely different, man. It is. Did you guys have a, a set of rules that you, you followed to keep something this large in scope on track? Because the, the length varies from episode to episode and, uh, or series to series and, and bit to bit. In fact, actually, you mentioned the Jordan one. This was funny. I was talking to somebody specifically about the length, and I was like, well, yeah, sometimes they're a little longer, sometimes they're a little shorter. It depends. The Jordan one, and I realized it was 23 minutes, and I was like, hang on a second. And I went back down and looked. You guys were so close. It was 23 minutes, 42 seconds. You couldn't put three seconds of pad on there. No, it didn't, it, didn't, it didn't have anything to do with the number, man. <laughs> so look, some some story. It's short stories. Yeah. It's opening a book of short stories. So some are shorter. One is seven minutes. This animated scene. One is maybe twenty nine minutes. It it just tell the story. That's all. No matter how long it took, tell the story. And then we learned as we went along. Okay, uh, like like when you win at anything, and you spend years. Do you, do you feel joy or do you feel relief? So if you're a coach, spending years and years and years, or if you're a dancer and you finally get that role, right? Or an actor doing this, or a, law or a litigator in the courtroom on a gigantic trial, do you feel joy or do you feel relief? So that's what we ask. There's a scene on that. There's a scene on, on a genius gene. Do you think that great athletes like an Earl Monroe or a Bill Russell, or a Michael Jordan. And I actually never asked you this question. Are you, do you believe that, you, that your mind is different? Do you believe that you have a genius gene, or is it a skill that you've just acquired and worked on for years? That is interesting. <laughs> um, I just kind of felt as though whatever I did was predestined. And as I did it, you know, this is just how it was supposed to happen. I mean, there are things that happened in my life that um, kind of determined, you know, the direction that I went. But at the same time, I just kind of took it and, and ran with it. It's like I never thought about going to college. It just happened. And it's just the course of what my life was supposed to be. That's, that's my own knowledge of thinking. Yeah. And, and so forth. I'm quite sure other people have a different, uh, you know, thought um, sense. But at the same time, it's the difference in people. Because when you think about, you know, how people think about themselves, am I the, am I the you know, the, the guy 
or am I just one of the guys? Yeah. You know, you know, deep down inside, you know, you are the guy. Yeah. You know, but the main thing in having other people play with you and deal with you is to let them feel as though they, they are part of what you're doing. Yeah. And that was important to me as I was growing up and starting to play. Was that something that you had to learn and figure out when you went from the Bulls to the Knicks and letting other people? <laughs> no, that's something I figured out when I was in college and I was scoring 40 points a game. And, and my college teammates were happy that I was doing it. There was no animosity. So I have kind of figured it out then. They wanted me to do things and I appreciated it, of course, but I also wanted them to feel as though I was for them as well. So that's kind of how my game evolved. And when I got into the NBA, it wasn't about scoring and scoring and scoring. It's about playing with guys and letting them know that you're for them as much as they're for you. Yeah, you know, the one thing, one of the things about Earl that makes him so special, I mean, Earl came up at the same time as uh, Pistol Pete Maravich. Another guy that averaged 44 a game, you know? And uh, what, what were you guys a year different than me? Yeah, about yeah. And, and, and uh, so, so the one thing that Earl's teammates always said to me at Winston-Salem, which is that Earl would be scoring his 44, his 50, his 60. But there were times, I, I ever tell you this, that Earl would say to his coach, take me out, and they wouldn't. And then he'd pretend to be injured, just so, or tired, his teammates could get minutes and points. Uh, that's pretty rare for a young man, a young player, in, in, in anything, you know? And is that right, or am I bullshit? That's what they told me, man. <laughs> that's what they told me, man. You could tell that with him right here, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty much it. And you know the reason why? Because I always knew that in the end, if I, I knew who would have the ball. So I didn't need to have it all, all game. I knew who would have it at the end. Let me ask you a question. You always, uh, one of the things when you watch someone who's truly great, truly a master and all that, is that it looks effortless. You know, it looks like it, it just flows through you. And a lot of the times listening to you talk, it, it kind of felt that way for you. You just responded in the moment and just did what felt right to you. But there's a, another great piece uh, where Wes is talking about throwing the ball from one backboard to the other. And he says, I would throw hundreds of balls, just practice hitting. And Wes hit, Unseld. Yeah, Wes Unseld, yeah, he's talking about hitting the board. And he'd push himself. And, and I'm curious, uh, while he was doing that, what, what were you doing to push yourself, to, to uh, elevate your game and stay on top of what you were great at? Well, let me just address uh, Wes coming into the league. The year before Wes came into the league, uh, I was one of the leading rebounders as a guard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the next year, Wes comes in the league. I never went under the basket again. He was just throwing it out, and I was catching it, you know. But, uh, you know, I, I always pushed myself by, by seeing what other people were doing. And, um, you know, one of the great things is that, you know, to be able to take what other people are doing and incorporate it into your own. And um, that's what I always did. And, and I didn't like copying, per se. But because once you do something, you make it your own. Uh, just like the so-called spin move that they say that I came up with or whatever. Well, I didn't really come up with it. Guy was just showing me how to do it. And I was doing it with two hands with, and coming around. And one time I was doing it with one hand and stumbled before I could get to the other hand. And all of a sudden that became the move because it was quicker. So, you know, it's, it's about adjusting, understanding what you're doing and how you can make it work for you. There's one last thing I want to ask about that West bit, because there's a funny button at the end of that where he goes, he used to win a lot of bets that way, uh, and he made a lot of money that way. Was any of that money yours? You ever bet him he couldn't do it? <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> no way. <laughs> you saw me all the time. 
Um, I, I'm gonna in a second. I have to turn it over because we got some audience questions. But there was uh, a few other things that I wanted to ask you guys about while you're here. You know, Dan, I was saying back in the room, one of the things I loved uh, was was the, the 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 way that you talk about. You weren't just boxing out. Uh, here's the the part about the WNBA. Here's the women's section. There's that. Let's move on. No, it's it's woven throughout, and it's a part of the history. It's part of the fabric. You capture all of that, and a lot of those stories I was ignorant to and found them fascinating. I'm wondering if there if those stories specifically, or or any stories throughout your process, kind of you started digging, realized you struck gold, and were like, I got to come back and do more on this later. Uh, so, pr yes, probably. Yeah. I mean, I went into it with a really good idea of the stories I wanted to tell. Many of them made the film, some did not. Yeah. Others I discovered along the way. Um, but that, go, I go back to that, uh, but people were so honest and open and touching. I mean, Connie Hawkins saying, the only thing people ever told me I'm good at is basketball. I mean, that touched me. Or Rebecca Lobo, this six foot six inch woman saying, it's the only place I felt good about myself being tall. You know, um, and, and, and uh, but the moment that really got me was Pat Riley. I mean, the great macho man, Pat Riley, I mean, clearly, in my opinion, one of the great coaches of all time, a real winner, uh, you know, erudite and, you know, Armani clad. And I go down to Miami to interview him, and I'm talking about this concept, do you feel joy or relief? And he says in the interview, I... I I was going to be fired if I didn't win in 85 against the Celtics. We won. I'm in the locker room, Kareem and Magic and the champagne, and I'm in the corner, and I can't get to the one person I need to get to. It's so crowded. It's like the D train. I can't move. And, and, uh, and he breaks down in tears on camera and nonstop crying, man, Pat Riley, you know, and uh, takes out the handkerchief, and he, he can't stop crying. Now... Because my relationship with my father wasn't great. I thought that he was talking about his own father in the corner. <laughs> no, his wife. <laughs> and he cried so much, I started crying. <laughs> I swear to God, I started crying. I mean, it moved me so much, man. And, but that's what the film is. And then there's great humor. Like, you know, if anyone remember the Iceman, George Gervin. I mean, this dude is one of the great scorers of all time. And he, he's saying when he got to play at Long Beach State, in the late 60s, he couldn't go to sleep at night. I said, well, why not? And he says, because Jerry Tocchtani and the coach gave him so much cash, the only place he could put it is under his mattress and he could never get comfortable. <laughs> 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 Stuff like that. <laughs> Earl, before we turn it over, man, in, in doing this series, did, did Dan shine a light on or, or illuminate anything? You know, as a dude who's lived and breathed the game for so long, was there anything that, for you, that you were surprised by that he uncovered or dug up and saw, like, oh, I didn't realize that or I didn't know that? Well, you know, for the most part, you kind of knew about most things that happen with guys. Um, the, the one segment that really kind of brought me to tears is the segment about um, Marie Stokes. And, um, you know, how a guy who was uh, like the prototypical power forward of today uh, in that day and age and getting um, stricken with encephalitis, was it? Mm -hmm. um, going on a plane, having a game, going to play a next game, and, and going into, getting a, into a coma, never really comes out of it for such a long time. And then from there on, being just, you know, having to rehab himself, uh, uh, become a totally dependent on everyone else. Completely and then, paraplegic, right? And then there's a guy by the name of Jack Twyman, who was a uh, teammate of his who... Um, wasn't very close to him, but became his benefactor. And that relationship between us. And Dan does it really well in this piece because he, he takes it from when J Jack Twyman is introduced um, at the Hall of Fame when Maurice is being inducted. Um, of course, Maurice had passed away a long time before this. But he's being inducted, and he's going back and forth between that. And I was there at the Hall of Fame at the time that uh, Maurice was inducted, and I remember this speech by Jack Twyman. And having known about Maurice Stokes and not having played 
at the Stokes game was really paramount for me as when I didn't go see Martin Luther King because I could have gone to the Marie Stokes game and I didn't. And it, it brings something home to me, but it also shows the humanity of our game in the sense that people care about each other. That's right, that, I, I'll let you go, because that, that was, the point of that scene was that was the beginning of the feeling and the formation of the NBA Players Association, the union, the idea that two players, that players could care for one another in the late 50s be completely ostracized from any benefits, no trainers on every team. Now they learn from this Marie Stokes benefit game, we could care for each other, and that's why there's a union, you know? So that, that, that was the point of the piece. Yeah, there's, there's so many. Uh, that's, that's why this is great, and that's why I'm saying congratulations. There's so many bits just like that, just like the, the humorous bit about the this is It's got everything. And even uh, if it's a story you were familiar with, it's from an angle that you, you may not have seen before, and, and it's really a joy to watch. It's on the ESPN app, and you can go ahead and, and you can watch all of them, but I, I do recommend people watching them as, in the order you intended and the way you sort of arranged them. I think there's a, a fun through line and kind of getting in your head as a filmmaker and seeing that. Um, I want to remind everyone, it's Tuesdays, 7 to 11 on ESPN, and uh, starting 10.30, it goes 8 to 12. It's all on ESPN on Tuesdays. We've got some questions in the audience. We've got some microphones in the audience. None of them for the Red Sox guy. Uh, let's see. First one right here. Here we go. Hey, fellas. How you doing? I just had a question. Going into this, was there a specific player or instance that sort of inspired you to make this? Uh, no. No, no. No specific player or instance. Um, just my own obsession and love for the game. No, 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 no player. There was a list of people I wanted to interview, and we got mo we got 165 of maybe the 170, but no, no specific. I think it's from within, <laughs> not oh, who I wanted to speak to or see. How much were you finding, because you amassed so much footage, and I mentioned this briefly in the room, but one of the things I loved was uh, Iverson talking about like the spontaneity of his crossover, and then right after that, talking about Earl and his style and the fluidity of it and, and the almost like jazz improvisation, and, and putting those two things together and bridging the gap between those generations. Did you write that down like you already knew with your knowledge, well, I'm going to try to find a connection between these guys, or it was all... Not oh my those God. guys. There are four different scenes called signature moves because I contend that the game on its on a, on a certain level is an art form it's a real art form so uh, and and actually we I cut to ballet and mu and different type of music you go from Barishnikov to Chubby Checker to Michael Jackson but there's a real connection in terms of dance and motion in the game so there are these four scenes called signature moves where Earl Monroe will describe his spin move, his hands, hips, eyes, mind, knees, or Iverson, his crossover, or, or LeBron James going rim to rim, or Steve Nash probing the middle. So I just try, I just, I just try to mix those in terms of generation. Yes. I did, so, and I did that for the audience sake. Like, I wanted to show LeBron early, yeah. or Steph Curry early, you know, as opposed to, Oh, you're you're an old guy, man. Why do we have to wait for that? You know, I mean, that's why I did it. You know, <laughs> yeah. amazing. All right, we've got was that one more? We got one more. We're gonna do. It's right here in front. I hope you like my shirt better than that guy. I do. Sorry, no, no disrespect. Um, I'm a as a filmmaker and a basketball player from Amsterdam, Europe. I'm a tourist these days in New York, visiting the film festival, but also checking out the Knicks next week. And I had a question for uh, for you. Do you have any hope? Is there hope for the Knicks? <laughs> I love, I love their. No, no, but seriously, I love their, I love their, unfortunately injured star, from Europe as well, mm -hmm. KP. I love their draft pick. I love their new coach. Do you have any hope? Well, I think that <laughs> there is hope. Uh, I think that um, you know, it's a, it's a good beginning for them. Uh, you know, f for so many years, the Knicks have always kind of been on the verge of having a good team, and then they would tear it down. I think um, tearing it basically down, but keeping the core people like KP and whatnot, I think that's a, that's a good um, uh, omen for this team. Um, certainly getting the new draft picks and 
and certainly we now that we are seeing other guys like Tier and whatever, these guys are starting to look like they can play as well. So I give them a couple years um, of playing together, and I think that we'll have something that we could cheer for. I mean, it hasn't been that long. I mean, before my ex-teammate uh, Phil Jackson came here, I mean, we were just a year out of being in the playoffs. So now building back from, from ground floor, I think that uh, they've got an excellent chance to, you know, be a very, very, very good team with some real good players. That was great. That's a great question. And for the, we're not laughing at you. That's just how New Yorkers respond now. It's a defense mechanism that we've developed over the years. We just have to laugh a little. Yeah, I interviewed um, Rick Smith in the movie I did on Reggie Miller and uh, and the Knicks. You know, he was a good guy. Yeah, he, was, he was only a basketball player because he was a giant. He was a giant. So that's I, they taught him how to play basketball in, in the U.S. In I agree 100% because... Uh, this was about seven or eight years ago, and he had retired a number of years before that, and he had absolutely no interest in basketball. Mm -hmm. None. He, he was riding some motorbike, you know, to, uh, you know, <laughs> mountains. That's what he was doing. I forget what you call it, but that's what he was doing. 7-4 <laughs> motorbike guy. <laughs> Wild. Uh, well, thank you guys for your questions. Also, we didn't get to touch on this, but because of all the hours of, uh, of footage and interviews that you guys logged, there's a book that's out as well. Oh, yeah. Thank you. That's good. Yeah, yeah there's uh, a book with the same title, <laughs> Basketball yeah, Love great Story. great Jackie McMullen. She did an oral history of the game, Basketball Love Story, and uh, it, it's... It's really a wonderful job that she did. Oh, my God, it's great. You know, yeah. so it's a good, you know, thank you for plugging that. Of course, yeah. of course. No, I mean, everything. <laughs> thank you guys for making this, honestly. You know, the, the series, it's it's fantastic, and it's great yeah. that we have all of these stories and all of this uh, this history and all of this stuff kind of logged forever, and we have it preserved because uh, you guys put the time in and made this uh, amazing project. So uh, congratulations again. It's a hell of an achievement, and I'm just going to pull my little card so I get the dates right here. It's Tuesday, 7 to 11. And then uh, starting October 30th, it notch, uh, notches up an hour to 8 to 12, but you can catch them all on ESPN or on, uh, on the app, on the ESPN app. Uh, one more time, please, everybody, you got to make a crazy amount of noise here and join me in thanking Dan Clores and Earl the Pearl Monroe for being here with us. Come on. <laughs> <laughs>